I had to look to see if it, it was the white legs or the pants that you, but anyway. Uh, back there on the table, listen, I, this, rarely do I come across a book that I'll pick up and read and say, wow. It just puts the finger on that particular truth. And this book on the roller coaster of grief, if you have not been there, you will be. And you talking about, okay, let me give you a chapter. Grieving can be like a roller coaster ride. What is grief? An entire chapter on that. Grieving is necessary. The different steps in the grieving process. And then there are answers to try to help you. Honestly, please, I don't want to take this book back with me. I want you to go back there and get it. Back there, go to the table. The young ladies will be there. And it'll be well worth it, I promise you. Now, I don't profit from these books. These books go right back into, I, I, I've got to get books out. So I've, it's back to printing and proofing and so on and so forth. Pastor, I'm going to give this to you as a gift. And uh, as soon as you go back and pay for it. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Your music is marvelous. Please don't ever change your music. This is just marvelous, and it's just not found around the country. Now, I'm just telling you, it's good, solid music here, and you keep it that way. It's like having a clean plate to put the message on. And uh, when the music starts going, the rest of it will follow quickly. And so, uh, by the way, thank you for the motel. Thank you for, let's see, I had applesauce, apple juice. I had uh, Greek yogurt. My doctor said it's good for the digestive track the enzymes. It must be good because it tastes terrible. Uh, but thank you. Uh, oh my goodness, so much, much. In fact, we're all going to my room after the service tonight. We've got plenty of food. But uh, the bottled water, the Bud Light, let's see, what else? <laughs> now, if you're visiting tonight, I'm kidding. I'm joking. I said that two years ago, and a woman said out loud, hey, this is my kind of church right here, boy. And I don't want you saying that. Uh, Anyway, I, the message tonight, if you're a teenager, I want you to get the CD. I'm assuming you, you're taping. And make sure you get this sermon and keep it for the rest of your life. If you're in your early 20s, I want you to get it. Now, that doesn't mean the rest of you don't listen. But this is crucial for that age group. And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Malachi, the last book of, of the Old Testament, chapter 3 and verse 6. Then we're going to go to Romans chapter 1, but we're going, to, we're going to launch from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Again, let me say, if you're a teenager, you get this CD and you hold on to it and, and listen to it regularly for the rest of your life. Um, if you're in your early 20s, I want you to get this CD and I want you to listen to it. If God has called you into, as a lady for being a missionary or or you believe God wants you to do whatever for him, you get this. If you're going to be a servant, you're a young preacher, you get this message and you listen to it. I'm not sure how much longer I've got on this planet. I know it's appointed a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And so every these are crucial times for me uh, to get across to you uh, these truths from the Word of God. And it's not an accident that the pastors invited me to come. And it's not an accident we're here tonight. So I want you to listen carefully to this message. And I want you to get the CD, and I want you to keep it, and I want you to listen to it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Let's stand and stretch just for a moment here. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He's saying, you better thank me that I don't change. Because if I change my message of salvation, the whole bunch of you go to hell. If I, if I change, the key word is the word change. If I change, you'll be consumed. So you're not consumed with judgment because I do not change. Now it only makes sense then that we as his children should not change. It only makes sense, doesn't it? Now turn to Romans chapter 1 
And we'll look at some of these verses in just a moment. But I just want you to hold your place there. Romans chapter 1 is a picture of the degradation of a society. <clears throat> you go from, and I will point it out in just a moment here, but you go from truth to change. Where does it end up? <clears throat> not just lesbianism, not just sodomy, but bestiality. So please understand, our society has yet to see the worst. It's, go it's going to happen. Now, we cannot stop the decay, listen to this, but we can delay the decay. The church ought to be heaven on earth. Your family ought to be heaven on earth. There shouldn't be anything that we do down here to remind us of the world. Now, you've got to get that stuck in your head. We, when you use the world to reach the world, you end up with the world and in the world. You have nothing. You have nothing. So the best thing for us to do then is set our eyes on heavenly affection, heaven above. And our music ought to be a reminder of heaven, not Garth Brooks. Our music, our dress, our standards ought to be a picture of modesty, not immodesty. All of this is seen, but it's a picture of the unseen. So I want to talk to you about this, the danger of change. The danger of change. Father, help me. This is so crucial. This is so important. Not for me. I've served my generation as best I could. But it's now for their generation. And may they listen very carefully. And God, help me to articulate this well. Not for my sake. I'm not asking for a great sermon. I'm asking for this truth to be settled in the hearts and minds of young people. So help me now, please. In Jesus' name, I beg for your help. Amen. You may be seated. There are two words I want you to write down. I want you to write down the word change and the word improvement. There's a difference between change and improvement. Change is the law of thermodynamics which means everything left to itself deteriorates. Let me say it again. The law of thermodynamics, boy, I'm telling you, I tell you how smart I am, aren't I? But everything left alone will deteriorate. That's a law. It's a law of God. It's a law. Now, improvement is, comes on purpose. If you have the right pattern and then you want to improve, I'm, I'm not against uh, new carpet, new buildings, and, and all of that, and all the trappings that go with it. I'm not opposed to that at all. There comes a time when you have to do it. I don't know how the folks, I don't know where you folks park. And I told them, she said, what's the church like? I said, it's the church of the sardines. Uh, <laughs> they just pack them in. Uh, and, uh, and I'm thrilled for you. But I've also learned by living a long time it doesn't take much for us to lose it. It just takes a few years and, and change here and change there. And the next thing you know, you don't even recognize. It's like measuring a two by four, cutting it, and using the one you cut as a pattern for the next one, and the one you cut for the pattern of the next one. Next thing you know, it's not even close to the original measurement. And that which we have known in the past, we can know in the future. But it's in the hands of you young people. And it's the hand, oh, by the way, of you leaders in this church too. And you parents. Now, in verse 23, it says this of Romans chapter 1. And change, now underline the word change. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, in the original language, creeping things are mother-in-laws. No, ah, quit that. All right. Now, go to verse 25. Verse 25. Verse 25. Who changed, underline it. Here it is again. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, go with me to verse 26. Verse 26. 
For this cause, now because of the changes that took place, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did choose did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. Now, it isn't that God didn't have any power. You have to understand God respects your decisions, good or bad. And he says you'll have to live with the consequences or the blessings. Got it? So here's what happens. In verse 23, they changed the glory of God. That's number one. In verse 25, they changed the truth of God. You got that? Then in verse 26, they changed the natural use of man. Now here's what happened in this digression. First, three things that changed. One, the glory of of God. And we'll talk about it in just a second. Number two then, because the glory of God is changed. Now number two, the word of God is changed. You got it? All right. Then the lifestyle of man is changed. Now you see what's happened? Uh, so the decay or the decadence of a nation always follows the same manner of decay of previous civilization. Read the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And you'll see we have more, we just had another holiday added, another holiday added. And that's what happened to the Roman Empire. They crumbled from the inside. Now, I said it a moment ago, we cannot stop the decay. But let me tell you what you young people can do, and you leaders in this church. You can delay the decay. Mom and dad, you may not stop what's going on out in the world. But you can delay the decay in your own home. So, what happens? All right, let me give it to you. The first step to destruction is the fact that these God's people, they know God, but they don't glorify God. Right, Hebrews 13, 15. We are to glorify God with the fruit of our lips. Open your big fat mouth and glorify God. All right, so where did this destruction start? It started when they quit glorifying God. Don't you be ashamed of what's being preached with this pulpit. You say amen to it. And let every cotton-picking visitor that comes say, oh boy, this church is different. This church is different. They're going to glorify God. That's why you males ought to learn to say amen. And you women ought to nod your head up and down and smile. And say, uh-huh. But uh, now, the first step to destruction we find in verse 21 is that they know God, but they don't glorify God. It's one thing to know God. It's another thing, another thing to glorify God. So what begins to change? The lack of glorifying God. It should not be just the preacher up here preaching. It ought to be you responding to the preacher up here preaching. To let everybody in your family, amen, amen, we're with the preacher. Let little Oswald know it, little Harriet know it. We're for the man of God. Let the whole cotton-picking family. Know. I've said cotton-picking more since here than I've ever seen it said in all these years. I don't know what you're drawing it out of me. But, uh, all right, now verse 22. They become wise in their own conceits. Now there's a digression here. First, they know God. You know God. But my question is, are you glorifying God? On Monday? On Tuesday, on Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, not just Sunday. But are you glorifying God in the way you dress, in the way you walk, in the way you talk? Man, it's embarrassing out here. Man, alive. Women have taken this half off sale seriously. <laughs> I mean, it's embarrassing. The last time my wife traveled with me, we got home, and she said, I'm so glad to get home. She said, I'm almost ashamed to be a part of the human race. Now, if that's what they want to do, then let them do that. But it shouldn't be your lifestyle. Okay? So the first step to destruction is you know God. Now let this settle in your heart, but you don't glorify God. All right? Then you become wise in your own conceit. You know better than God. You know better than the pastor. You know better. You're smarter than your mom and dad. After all, you're 12 now. And... And you wear pantyhose, so you've got to be smarter than everybody else. You young girls, listen to me. Your best friend should not be a 12-year-old girl. 
What you're saying is, I will tell her things I'll not tell my mama. And that's dangerous. Uh, your best friend ought to be your mama and your daddy. Hey, fellas, your best friend ought to be your wife. Your best friend lady ought to be your husband. All right? So the first thing we find in Romans 1 is, the first step to instruction, you know God, but you don't glorify God. Then you become wise in your own conceits. Then the Bible, look at verse 23, verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Now here's what happens. We know God, but we don't glorify God. We become smarter than those that are over us, our moms and dads and the preacher and so on. Then what happens? We become wise in our own conceits. Then we, the next step is we change God into an image. And this is where seminaries come in and professors come in. And the next thing you know, the capital punishment is, is, uh, is for some right-wing nut. Uh, a King James Bible only position? Why, you're crazy. No, you're not. But you have to understand what happens. All of a sudden, now we send our preacher boys off to a college or a seminary, and they become more like the college than the church that sent them away. You preacher boys ought to be more like your pastor than any professor in a college. So, what happens? You know God, but you don't glorify God. Next step is idolatry. Uh, we, we, Hammond's not your headquarters. Longview's not your headquarters. Murfreesboro's not your headquarters. Heaven's your headquarters. And don't you let some outside, I'm not saying they're bad, not saying that at all, but I don't let somebody on the outside influence you more than those on the inside. Then what happens in verse 24? Look at verse, 20, verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them unto uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now what happens? They begin to worship the body. All of a sudden, it's the latest styles. All of a sudden, I don't care. You're not to fashion yourself after this world. So I don't care what this world does fashion-wise. Well, when my wife made all the clothes for our girls. You couldn't buy them anywhere. You couldn't get anything modest. So she got the sewing machine out, and she started sewing. Taught the girls how to sew. And you ladies, let me give you a new word that you need. It's the word cook. Yeah. <laughs> you ready for a new word? Are you listening? Stove. <laughs> Two words. Clean house. Uh, but what happens, you begin to worship the body. Now, if you're going to get mad at me, you're just going to have to get mad at me. I'm leaving town anyway, so what do I care? <laughs> side burns up, side burns down. <laughs> the Bieber look. Then the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, he went hair right up there. So teenagers all over America, right there. Hi. How are you? I drive by watching young people going to some of these Southern Baptist churches in our area. And it's just crazy. These girls are plump to begin with. And they let their midriff show, and they got their pants down here, way down here. And, and, and when they walk, it looks like jello. <laughs> now, this is going to be put on the internet, and I'm going to start getting a lot of mail again. <laughs> and I really, I just want to go over and jiggle it, you know. But anyway, uh, it's a shame. Do you women know what you look like from the rear end in a pair of yoga pants? <laughs> Do you have any idea? Somebody ought to get on a roof and take a video camera of you from your rear. Because it looks like a pair of hogs in a sack fighting. Get your dictionary out and try to figure out how to spell misogynist. It's a shame. Now get mad at me, but it's a shame. 
So we start worshiping the body. That's what, that's what happens. Now, the first step is you know God, but you don't glorify God. I'm not talking about Sunday. I'm talking about Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Everybody you work with all know you're a Christian. Not because you flaunt it or shove it in front of their face, but they'll see you pray for your meals. They'll see you work hard. And when they get sick, you ought to go minister to them, try to help them. Then the second thing is idolatry comes in. Something outside of the local church. Influences outside of your pastor. Influences of some other dad rather than your dad. Some other mother rather than your mother. Then what happens? Then you begin to worship the body. Now in verse 25, now you have homosexuality, lesbianism, and then eventually bestiality. You see the degradation? Then the thing, last thing, he says God gives up. Now that doesn't mean God has no power. God, just like some father said, I've tried to tell you. You're not going to listen to me. Well, have at it, girl. Have at it, fella. Uh, God never told them in the Garden of Eden. He, he said to them, don't, don't touch that tree. It belongs to me. But whatever you want to do with the rest of the tree, that's your decision. But listen, God never stopped Adam and Eve when they went to the wrong tree. And God is not going to stop you. So you keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, waiting for thunder to come and God to drop our hammer on you. It's just going to be the natural process of reaping what you sow. So listen carefully. All of this started when they left truth. So I want you to write two words down. I want you to write truth down and I want you to write the word change down. The battle is between truth and change. So error has no boundaries. Truth has boundaries. Someone said about a preacher, he changed his position. Nobody ever changes his position. Listen carefully. Write this down. Change is a position. Change in itself is a position without boundaries. <clears throat> you need boundaries. You need a mama that says, uh-uh, not in this house. You need a daddy to say, no, not in this house. You need a pastor to get up and say, not in the house of God, not here, you're not. Now, you'll stop and say, well, he's trying to run our family. He doesn't care. He, he's not trying to run your household. He just said, don't bring your drama down here. He has every right to look over the house of God. Every right. So change is a position. When you change, you have a new position. Truth is set. Truth is stable. Change is unstable. When you leave truth, you don't stop anywhere. You just keep on changing. That's why it's called backsliding. Get on a slide, turn backwards, and push yourself. You can't stop yourself. So what happens? Here's a deacon. He has a fuss with his preacher. He gets mad. He quits church. He starts drinking. He runs around with his wife. Divorces his wife. He ends up in a motel with a harlot. He marries the harlot. Gets in trouble with the law. He goes to jail. He calls the preacher at midnight and says, I need help. Where did it all start? It all started because he got mad at truth. Truth made him mad. Don't let truth make you mad. Yes, truth has boundaries. But that's good for you. Yes, truth is finite. Change is infinite. It has no destination. Because change is the destination. So there are two positions you're going to have to choose tonight. You're going to have to choose the position of truth or choose the position of change. Change is not a transition. Change is a position which is transition. So what happens? Okay, I went to Michigan State University in 1963 as a, as a freshman. Abraham Lincoln was president. And uh, so I went to Michigan State. We had 40,000 students in 1963. The first class I went to had a 1,000 students in that auditorium class. I came from a little town of 800 people in Michigan. Our graduating class had 63 in it. Our superintendent taught creationism. Uh, our science teacher taught creationism. And they said, rightly so, that the other was a theory. It's not fact, it's a theory. Well, that's how I was raised. So I'm sitting on the front row in this first class of higher education. And the professor says, 
I don't know where this came from. This came out of nowhere. He said, anybody here believe the Bible to be the word of God? Well, my mama said it was. My daddy said it was. My preacher said it was. My science teacher said it was. Our superintendent of school said it was. And I shot my hand up just like that in the front row. And he laughed at me. And the students laughed. He said, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, well, Mr. Gray, when I get through with you, you won't believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Now, that was my introduction to higher education. And here's what he said. Everything is relative, Mr. Gray. There are no absolutes. Well, then don't talk to me about consensus of science. Don't even talk to me. I don't even want to hear from you. Now, somewhere in here, you have to understand there's a, there's a teaching there. You, either this, this is absolutely a pulpit of wood. Yeah. This is absolutely a microphone. This is absolutely a choker. Uh, and this is absolutely the Word of God. Absolutely. Now, you've got to make up your mind, young people. And you either take the position of change or take the position of truth. Now, there's no such thing as stability in error. Error keeps changing. Error, there are 800 and different versions of the Bible out there. And they now, the guy sent me from California, this college, and every word Bible, 865 word Bible for the busy man. To me. Said, you're a chancellor. Would you write something about it? I wrote garbage on it and sent it back to him. <laughs> they have a phonics Bible now. They have a, a Bible for, yo. Uh, they've, they've got... Every type of Bible that you'd want, but, but, that, but the King James Bible is, is not copyrighted. The notes in some of the Bibles are because that's somebody putting notes in there. The Schofield is, is because the Schofield notes are in there. You got me? Okay. But the Scripture itself, anybody can print the Bible, King James Bible. The, new, the NIV, you can only copy 700 verses out of the NIV. Because if you do, you've broken the law because those scriptures are copyrighted. You can't memorize more than 700 scriptures. It's in the front of the book. You open it up and it's right there. Now, I'm just saying to you, you've got to make me mind. Are you going to live uh, where truth is set or are you going to live change all the time? Will you be the same when you turn 50 that you are now, young person? Will you be the same? Uh, will you believe the same when you're 75? I hope that you get some things settled. Now, I've learned a lot in these years, but I've added two. I've never subtracted. The Bible never says diminish. Don't you diminish a thing. Now, let me give you some examples, all right? Write down modesty. The truth of modesty. Esther Williams received from Europe a bikini and showing the midriff. Esther Williams was not known to be a Christian. But here's what she said. She wrote back and said, how dare you? You think that I will wear this in public and show my midriff? Now, forgive me for saying it, but she had some convictions. I don't agree with that. I think you ought to be modest. You ought to cover your thigh up. And Lord, no, never mind. Don't get me started. Uh, things have changed. Okay. My grandma, great-grandma's day, when they went to the beach, they, their clothes went all the way down the ankle. Look at the old pictures. Then, <laughs> all of a sudden, they started showing the ankle. It started going up a little bit. And preachers screamed and hollered, you bunch of hussies, what in the world are you doing showing your ankles? So what happened? Society kept changing, and pretty soon they showed the calf. Then the preacher got up and said, what in the world are you women doing in public showing your, your calf? Now, nakedness is where the, the, the thigh is, according to the Bible. But I have a question. What happened to the ankle preaching? We capitulate because of society changing. And then we change the very definition of modesty. P please listen to me. I, I love you. I'm not trying to hurt you. So what's happened throughout society is now they, they don't wear hardly anything. 
If you don't believe me, come back to the motel with me. I'll show you what's going on at that motel down there. It's, it's embarrassing. How in the world can a mother let her teenage daughter walk around with basically underwear on in public? I don't understand that. I'm going to tell you something right now, bless God. I'd never let my girls lay out in the front yard in a bikini to get a good tan so that some backslidden church member would feel comfortable when they came to our church. I would never sacrifice my wife or my daughters uh, to the lustful eyes of men. And whether you like it or not, if you see a woman in bikini, you don't start singing Amazing Grace. Are you dead? Maybe you're a queer. That's probably what the problem is. It's all right to say that. That's what they call themselves. Well, you can tell the public school's got some of you. But anyway, <laughs> modesty. So there are two positions. You're the set in truth or you're changing. You can't get any truer than true. You can't get any righter than right. Truth is truth and right is right. Truth does not change. And what was right 50 years ago is right tonight. What was wrong 50 years ago is wrong tonight. Though we change what is right and what is wrong in our own minds, right is as right as it was 50 years ago. So what was wrong in grandpa's day is also wrong in grandson's day. So wrong is changing and changing is wrong. The act of changing is what is wrong. You leave truth, you leave boundaries, and when you leave boundaries, you leave restraint. You leave restraint, you never stop. Boundaries are restraint, you need restraint. If you're so smart, why do you have a school teacher? If you're so smart, why did God give you a mama? If you know it all, why did God give you a daddy? Why did God give you a youth director or a pastor? Because you need someone. So you need restraint because you cannot change just a little bit. It becomes a slide. So we have the notion that separation is staying a certain distance from the world. But as the world gets worse, that means Christianity gets worse. It's not a certain distance from the world. It's truth from the Word of God. Come on up here, my friend. I'm going to let him represent truth. <laughs> I know this is a poor analogy, but I'm doing the best I can. This is truth. Truth protects me. So if I'm going to preach the word of God and I'm going to preach it and you come after me, truth will protect me. <laughs> so that means there are boundaries here that if I stay here, I'll be protected. But in us is a little rebel in every one of you. When somebody tells you, don't you, the first thing you say, you just sit and watch, my bless God. we are all, all got a rebel in us. We all do. Now, in the Garden of Eden, there was no beer. In the Garden of Eden, there was no pornography. In the Garden of Eden, there was no playboy philosophy. But there was sin. Where did it come from? Rebellion. Yeah. Don't touch that tree. And Eve said, which, which, which one? Well, they didn't like that, did they? Put it on the woman. Uh, <laughs> now, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So here's what change is. Change is saying society is going that way. Come on up here. Hurry, son, the Lord's coming. <laughs> Move up here. Get behind me. Get behind me. So what happens is the world steps over here. And I, 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 I'm the leader here. But I love this person. So what happens is there's a temptation for the leader to step out here and say, I is your leader. But I know enough about you. You think this will satisfy you? Not on your life. You're going to keep changing. Because that's the nature. So then what do leaders do? There's truth. There, and I can't lose this church member. So I step over here. So the next generation pays a horrible price. So this is going to happen. Get back behind me there. 
This is going to happen in your family. It's going to happen in your church. It's going to happen in your ministry. Yeah. Sooner or later, somebody's going to rebel. Yeah. But when they do, don't step out here and change yourself as a leader. Stay back here. And say, yeah, get back here where you belong. What in the world does that matter to you? <laughs> now, that's not very popular. Yeah. And you'll not be loved as much as you want to be loved. But you'll salvage a generation. Amen. Jack Howell's too tough. Lee Robertson, Lester Ruloff, too tough. Get off of that, yeah. you big baby. Amen. Well, he did everything but call my name. We'll come back next Sunday night. We'll call your name. <laughs> Brother Ruloff sitting in my office. He said, Brother Greg, you know what the people need? I said, what's that, Brother Ruloff? Porcupine preaching. I said, what is that? He said, that's where the people get the point. <laughs> All right. The stuff you watch on television. I love Lucy. I don't mean I love Lucy. I'm, I'm trying to use this illustration here. <laughs> Boy, you pick up on all my faults, don't you? Uh, the program, I Love Lucy, CBS said that when they were in their pilot, they had one bed. Now, Lucy Arnaz and Desi Arnaz were married. But CBS came back and said, not on our network. So you'll have a bed for Desi and you'll have a bed for Lucy. CBS did that. Yeah. Now, there are more nude scenes on daytime television. Yeah. It's a shame yeah. what's going across our airwaves. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to use this as an example to you. Example of modesty. Example of what you watch on television, right. it's a cesspool. Yeah. <laughs> My wife loves Barney Fife. That don't sound right. Uh, <laughs> but she can watch a, a Andy Griffith show. And she, when the first words come out, she'll tell you the whole plot. Yeah. And sit there and watch the whole thing. <laughs> she loves it. And she loves Perry Mason. She'll watch Perry Mason. And she'll try to guess who did it. Now, we've seen the thing 50,000 times, but we forget. <laughs> so it's a little game we play. We say, I don't know, did she do it or did he do it? She said, I don't remember. Well, I said, well, make a choice. <laughs> anyway, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Here's true. <laughs> That's why. Some preachers can say what they say and get away with it yeah. because they're protected. Amen. Hey, you women, get with it. Dress right, walk right, talk right. Get rid of your britches. What in the world has got wrong with you? Amen. <laughs> hey, get rid of those yoga pants. What the matter's the matter with you? <laughs> Truth protects. Young people, please, you're, you're young, you're bright, figure out truth now. And don't you change a lick. All right? How about politically? You're, this, you're not going to like this statement, but prohibition worked. Yeah. It did. Well, let me tell you what happened. Society said, no, we want our martinis. And political pressure caused politicians to step out and rescind something that did work. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, 15 states say it's all right to smoke marijuana, yeah, right. knowing the facts of it. Yeah, right. So what's happened? Politicians now are over here. Yeah. I wrote this statement down. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Um, okay, here it is. We elect people to control us from us, and thus they are us, and we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, c control them, and thus no one controls us. It's a spiral. It's, it's going to get worse unless we've got men of God like this who stand for truth and say, let's, let's stay behind truth and don't change. And then you say amen to him. 
And then you live it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. You young ladies that are enamored, enamored with these uh, Britney Spears that gyrate on the stage and have uh, actually uh, a sex act on the stage and get millions of dollars and you look up to them. It's a shame. But I get it settled now. Your body is holy. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't you hurt the Holy Spirit. One man for one woman for one lifetime. And you'll be as happy as hog on ice. I don't know hog on ice. What does that mean? I've heard that my whole life. But anyway, do you understand the essence here? You're either going to stand behind truth or you're going to let somebody lead you and there's what's going to happen. And you think it's going to stop? No, it won't stop. It's going to get worse. I predict pedophiles will have their rights one day. A woman in Florida married her dog. Well, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. We know the Bible. But we've got to have to stand behind truth. Hell, get back over here where you belong. What in the world's the matter with you? I'm going to knock you in the next place. <laughs> now, you get mad at that strong preaching. But we need that. Now, according to Romans 13, we need political leaders who are real ministers of God. We need that. But I can't control what the political world does. I have a tie that Donald Trump sent me. I, I, sent him a, I sent him some money. And I said, I have never in, in these 70 some years sent a politician a dime. Because as far as I was concerned, you're a bunch of crooks. I was in my letter. And I said, I'm going to send you money. But this is the only time I've ever done it. You better win. And he lost. But he sent me a tie. He sent me a letter. And then on a tie, it's stamped on there, uh, official tie from the White House. I love it. I love it. Billy Graham said, the worst decision I ever made was to get involved with politicians. You and I need to understand something. Mom and dad, find truth, stay behind it. And when something new comes along, don't you fall for it. Don't you fall for it. Mama's dress was good enough for her, it's good enough for you. How would you feel you saw your mama in a bikini? It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I'm not going any further with that, but it's embarrassing. But please understand, I don't care what society does. You're going to have to choose truth or change. Change is infinite. It never quits. That's why there are 865 Bibles out there. They actually have a coloring book Bible you can color. Yeah, I could never stay inside the line. So, uh, But do you understand? Please, young people. I've served my generation. I probably could have done a lot better. But I did serve my generation. Now it's yours. I worry for my grandchildren. I worry. Will you young people... Be the leaders that your parents are. It's up to you. Truth is stable. Change is unstable. So you stay behind truth. And if this rascal here wants to wander on out there and he wanders on out there, you stay right here. Stay right here. Yeah, get back here. If he doesn't come back, you still stay right here. Still stay here. And let there be a statement made. I'm going to stand behind truth. Father, help us tonight. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastor. Thank you for the stability. Lord, all these years I've been coming here, I love it. I love it. Because it is who we are that this church represents. And God pity if this church starts changing. Help us to stay behind truth, stay behind the man who preaches the truth, and be of one mind and one accord. 
our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder, without anybody looking around, I wonder tonight, are there some of you that you say this is a real battle, preacher? The pressure of schools, the pressure of family and neighbors, honestly, and churches, other churches. I feel the pressure, preacher. And I want you to pray for me that I'll have a backbone and I'll stay behind truth, no matter good days or bad days. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm not looking. This is between you and God. But I wonder if you might ask God to help you. Would you raise your hand and say, oh, God, please help me. I want to stay behind truth. Please help me. Now, Father, bless this pastor, bless this church, and thank you for what they've stood for for all these years. And I've not seen any change at all. But I pray that we'll hide ourselves behind truth. God, help us. That's where our protection is. Please, in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Would you stand, please? The pianists are going to play, and uh, the altar's down here. You use it.